Hello guys, uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, five things that I kind of sum up, it's not everything, but five things that I learned by programming in Ruby on Rails for like uh, eight, nine years now. I left recently to work with JavaScript for a new company, but doing this, uh, it actually reinforced to me some of the things that I never really paid so much attention when I was working with Rails, that I would like to stress it here. Best thing about uh, the winter time in Germany. Uh, the first thing is um, data. And this is a very important point because when you are starting a new code base, on a new domain actually, right? It comes to a new company, they do something. And the first thing that you should kind of grasp is what's the domain about. And the representation of the domain in the, in the code or used by the code will be the data that's probably stored in some database or some databases, right? Some storage. Um, this data is going to be input and output to the to the customers, to the clients, uh, to the users of the software. And when you are developing a, a, co a code, this is mostly where you see the input of most of your functions, right? Um, when you are getting something transforming it or processing or doing something in order to show it back to the user uh, or even receiving some input from the user and also doing this uh, transformation to put it on the storage and the thing I, I, I kind of appreciate in, in, in Rails is how uh, the data in the database is the attributes of your model right so Rails does this loading uh, this, this gener generates these attributes on the fly. So if you have a column in the database for a model, this model has this attribute that automatically appears in your model uh, class, uh, the instance. And this is really interesting because you automatically have everything you need already. You get the, you get the object and you can invoke these things up, uh, immediately. Sometimes this was uh, obvious when I was working with Rails, that it's just how it is. But when you're not, and you're working with another language that doesn't do this, another kind of framework, uh, especially if you have to write the queries by yourself, you kind of realize uh, sometimes you are working with some data in, the, in an object, I don't know, three, four, five, ten functions down the road before you reach the user, uh, in, in, a, in a chain of calls, and you're like, uh, what is this? Right? What, what did this come from? It got transformed, mutated, worked so much that you don't even know where is this data? Where did these things that I am uh, processing this object come from? If you keep this proximity to the table, it's really straightforward because you know this is a book object. It has these attributes and these attributes are on the, on the table. So you can kind of connect the things in your head much more easy, especially if you're a newcomer to a new database. Uh, the idea here is that what the user, I like to say like this, what the user understands as data should be as close as possible to what uh, you have in your, in your table, right? So if a user believes a book is, has A, B, C, and D properties, that should ideally be on your table, right? So with this, you, you are correctly modeling the domain. I think uh, this is, it will be the number one having the data similar to what the user believes the data is. Otherwise, you have to make it on the fly all the time. A second point <clears throat> that comes from this a lot when I'm talking about Rails specifically, when people are uh, thinking about um, using Rails or not, the criticisms about Rails is that um, this, the, the, the Rails does this loadings for you, and sometimes the queries are not performant, sometimes this is the active record, which is the framework, the ORM, is kind of uh, doing things be uh, behind the scenes that you don't really know what it is, so you think that the performance is gonna take a hit because maybe the queries are not very performant. So, this doesn't apply always, of course, but I would really recommend you take a look in your system to think about this, like, does the does the, the, the bad performance you are thinking about come from bad modeling, right? Very straightforward uh, example. You want to do a query 
let's say again, for a book, or you're doing a drinks uh, database for a bar, which drinks you use, which components, whatever, if you make a bunch of tables that have nothing to do with the things themselves, and whenever you have to do a query, you have to join everything, a bunch of tables together, <coughs> excuse me, this is uh, probably one of the reasons why your system is doing uh, not so well. Uh, you have to fetch things that should be together, but you have to join a bunch of tables differently together. Um, of course, in some domains, you have to do the separation, but um, I don't know, many times it smells to me as bad modeling. It's, it's engineering talk, as I like to say, right? Like people just try to make extreme abstractions and decompose a system to the point where <clears throat> it doesn't even make sense anymore. <clears throat> Jesus. Um, so this is another thing. Like if 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 you think of the query that's going behind the scenes is the reason for your bad performance. I worked in companies that had millions and millions of queries per minute going on, like 40, 30 million queries, uh, 30 minute calls, uh, HTTP calls coming into the system, performing a bunch of stuff. Work fine, right? Maybe if you're working on Twitter, uh, Facebook, maybe it doesn't. I'm not sure. I never worked such a huge, huge scale. But I work with large, large scale uh, companies and the query is fine if the modeling is straightforward. And especially if you use the correct storage devices, right? <clears throat> so before you say that the things are not performant, make sure your modeling is not scattered, overly abstracted. Some engineer didn't go there and say, oh, let's protect ourselves against the future and turn one, one thing that should be one into many into 15 tables that have to be joined together every time you have to get something. So this is another thing. Extreme performance uh, concerns sometimes comes from bad model, not from underlying queries all the time. This is the second point. But the third point that connects to this is what I call framework code. Now, I don't have so, many, so much experience with many different frameworks in other languages. Like I said, I've been working with Rails for like eight years now. Uh, and I see like some stuff in Spring, uh, some stuff in some uh, JavaScript, uh, Node.js uh, frameworks. And what I call framework code is when the developer needs to do something on your system, do they worry about the domain, so the, the, the heuristics of your, of your software, of your domain, or are they worried about um, stuff that you wrote for engineering sake? Right, so it's, like, it's what I like to call domain code versus engineering code, right? Domain code is things that your clients care about. Of course, your clients care about performance of the system, obviously, but that's, but understand what I'm trying to say. Engineering code, for example, is framework code, right? It's loading, it's um, fetching, it's querying. These things the client doesn't care. The client wants to know if the, like um, the drinks uh, getting counted together because uh, oh this ingredient is this here how do I make a drink how do I make a book how do I make an accountant statement how do I make these are the things they work in their daily lives these are the things they know about this is the domain everything else that's trying to help the domain appear to the user is what I call frameworking code it's like supporting code so you should take out frameworking code from the developer concern as much as possible, right? If a developer can go in there, like how to change a light bulb. First step, I don't know if it's too high, put a chair in here, something for you to step on, go in there, switch the thing, take it out, put the new one, press the light, see if it works, all right, it's done. But not about, is this is the soil stable, right? Am I gonna put the chair in here, it's gonna fall down. Is the chair stable, do I have to check the, everything is the, the hinges, everything with the chair support my weight. These things are not important, they're not domain, right? They are auxiliary for you to do what the, what the client actually wants you to do. So try to hide this from the developer's concern. Sometimes when you're doing a lot of these things, uh, when you have like no uh, frameworks or very uh, shallow frameworks, frameworks are not very opinionated where you have to write a bunch of stuff, I recommend actually you have some people that exclusively worry about the framework, right? So they, they write the job managers, they write the whatever else you need to get the domain working so that people can just come and concentrate on the domain code, which is what actually, uh, for most companies, most startups, they try to solve an actual uh, 
customer problem. That's what they really care about. That's what they make the money with, right? So this is the third concern, framework code. The fourth one is what I'm calling here pragmatic loading. Uh, because in Rails, you don't really require a bunch of stuff. By requiring import, uh, you know, bringing other files, other classes, other stuff into your code. You don't spe uh, specifically go in there and type what you need because Rails has this thing where if you put the, your code in some specific places, it gets auto-loaded, which means that it can be lazy, it can be unlazy, which again, framework code, it's Rails concern, not mine. So um, as long as it's performing well, which I, like I, we just talked about it, uh, it's normally not a problem, uh, especially because in production, they do a, a, a load, up, load up front, in development, they do a lazy loading. That's out of the, of the question. The thing is, sometimes people have this extreme drive towards, no, 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 I want to specifically declare in this class which uh, files I'm importing because I want them to be really clear. I kind of understand this. You know, sometimes it's annoying when you, when I'm working with some uh, Rails databases, Rails code bases, especially when new ones, where you have a function and you don't really know what the hell did this come from, right? This thing is in there and you cannot trace it. This is a problem for organization of code, right? Like uh, if you're using things, you should kind of know like the services folder or however you want to call it, interactors, whatever it is. Um, you have this, uh, this place where you know like these utilitary functions are going to be close by, right? And the naming should be really obvious as well. So some, some standards help you find it where, where you don't have specific imports. Uh, this, is really, this is really a nice thing. Like you, don't, you don't really necessarily need to put all of that stuff, all of those imports uh, and exports like you do in JavaScript in every file. Sometimes it's dozens of lines of imports, right? And then you have to write an index, sometimes especially in TypeScript because you have to specifically put an index in there that imports all the folder and exports it immediately so you can just get everything from the index which uh, it's a nice standard it's better than nothing but still it's kind of uh, again framework uh, jibber jabber it's like it's better without it if you can right this is the, this is the third uh, the fourth point um, this this concern about explicit requirements because you think you're gonna lose track of what's being used on your file uh, very often, it's a concern about organization and standards of your code base, right? This, this, this happens a lot. And putting it all together, uh, of course, there's many other things I could talk about, but I want to be a little concise in this video. So another thing that putting it all together, I think, is very present in Ruby talk, which, again, I never understood what I was, I never specifically understood, is this talk about developer happiness that the Ruby community, Rails community, talks so much about. And yeah, I was happy doing it. I love, I love coding, right? So the developer happiness was there because I was developing and I like to develop, so. But today, I see very clearly when I try to do something, especially the code is really coupled, you know, and the domain, you cannot see it, it's mixed with a lot of framework code, you have to understand a bunch of a bunch of stuff about oh, what is this doing or no. This is just a checker to see if this, if that. Okay, this is a this is a process manager. This is a, a queue manager. It's a bunch of uh, uh, libraries that you end up writing yourself in the middle of your domain sometimes, right? Um, and and you try to get one function from here, and since you don't have this automatic requires that I mentioned. You have to import a lot, a lot of stuff in the beginning, and if you're using no RAMs, no kind of uh, advanced in, uh, dependency injection, you don't have things that just appear in your function, in your class, right? Especially if you're not using classes. Um, so you try to invoke something to test it on, on the console. It, you have to pass dependencies like, you know, like they say in, in some front-end frameworks, like props down, events up, but if you want props down, you have to send the props all the, all, the all the way from create server to the function, specific one you want to test. Sometimes this is hell to do, 
because you have to load a bunch of stuff that you don't care about. You don't care about the queue manager, the process manager, the job manager, whatever manager. You just want to give this function a cup, a, a, a array of drinks, a recipe ID, and on the other hand, you have everything. You want everything done for you, like the, the inventory handled, whatever. But you can't because you have to load everything manually up front. And this also, of course, makes testing really harder, uh, much harder because you also have to do the same thing. Sometimes you have to mock infinite amount of stuff. And if you're using this uh, API calls, like, you know, like by API, I don't mean HTTP, I mean the interface that you have to mock, somebody changes the, the actual implementation, you test break, you don't know why, okay, somebody changed that, I am implementing from that, now it's broken because they added a function in there and the function is not mocked in here. The, the linter is complaining. Um, so developer happiness comes from this. You, you don't, you can do, you, you can get, I call it Lego code. You can just get this function here, pass just the domain objects you need and see the result in a test, in a spec or in the console. You can get, uh, you can go straight to the console, get something that you have and just see the function running by itself and giving you a response. So when you have this freedom of taking this piece and this piece together, invert the other, put them in here, put something in the middle, like a flow, you know, you're just playing with the, with the, with the classes, with the functions, with the method calls uh, freely. Uh, I see it today that all these things together, easy as data, not worrying about code that is outside of your concern, of your domain concern that you're doing right now. Um, being able to decouple everything, have the things that you want immediately appear auto-loaded in there for you, this really makes developing a joy because you, you just do what you want. It just happens. Your only concern is, am I doing the right thing, right? This frees up a bunch of uh, space for the QA, for your product uh, manager, product person to actually uh, look at your code and, and make sure it's doing the right thing, especially because Ruby in itself, not a real thing, but a Ruby thing, Ruby is so good to make DSL, right? It's domain-specific languages. You can actually write it in a way that your product uh, manager, your QA person, or anyone by that, even your customer, if you do it uh, very well, um, can look at it and they kind of can understand what's going on, right? Like it is, there's not so much jibber jabber about uh, returns and uh, if else's. You just make a function call straight, pop, first step, second step, third step, and then step in the cup, and they look like, yeah, yeah, that's how I work. That's what actually should be, be happening here. So, um, that's it that I wanted to show you today. Um, I lost my, my thing. Here it is. Uh, I want to talk up quick, really quickly about these things. Uh, let me know if it's useful for you guys. I'm just trying to share some of my experiences with it. Of course, I'm not saying Ray is the best language, the best framework, Rook is the best language. It's the one I like the most so far. But um, I'm going to talk this in another video about how companies today, you get hired for a new company that does a new language that you they don't necessarily ask you for experience on it, it's just experience in general. But there's more to programming in a language than just um, writing code. You actually have to get the philosophy of the language, right? How do you do things in this language? What packages are there? Uh, but we'll go over that in another video, not this one. So thanks for watching. Hope to hear from you soon. Cheers.